Well, thank you very much for leading, uh, Alex. And uh, we're looking at Numbers chapter five. I don't know what you thought when we read that passage. Uh, I thought you, I bet you were wondering what on earth we're going to learn from this passage tonight. Um, here's the problem, you see. How can you, how can you walk with God when you know that you still sin? How can I walk with God when I know that I still sin? That was the problem for Israel. Remember the context. Israel, the people of God, had set out on a journey from Sinai to the promised land. It should have taken a few weeks, but instead it's going to take them 40 years because of their unbelief. And along the way, they're going to disobey God, as we know, again and again. And so God, in his grace, provides a way in which their sins can be dealt with. In fact, here in Numbers chapter 5, God highlights three specific kinds of sin and provides a remedy so that it can be dealt with. And actually, in each case, we find that the remedy is Christ. Um, unless their sins are dealt with, they can't possibly think that God is going to remain in the midst of they can't possibly think that God is going to turn a blind eye to their sins. God is holy, but he's also gracious and he provides a remedy for the problem of their sins. So what we have here in, in Numbers chapter five, what we have are three kinds, specific kinds of sins that God provides a remedy for. Sins that characterize God's people in the wilderness as they're traveling to the promised land and in each case as i say we will see that the remedy is actually the lord jesus christ now, numbers chapter five sounds strange really quite bizarre let's be honest i don't know how many times you've read that before uh, but maybe you've read it and you thought well I, I really don't know quite what to think about this passage but actually it's incredibly relevant to us we all want to know, don't we, what the remedy for sins, for our sin is, the remedy for our, our various sins. And, and that's what God provides here for God's people. So let's go into the passage. First of all, verses one to four, we, we have sins against the holiness of God. Sins against the holiness of God. Verses one to four. The Lord highlights to Moses three kinds of uncleanness in verses one to four that are really an offense against the holiness of God. So uh, there were th three kinds of sins or uncleanness that would cause God to request to require that his people, that those who sin should be put outside the camp. So so first of all, there's leprosy, somebody that has some kind of a skin disease or somebody that has a bodily discharge, whether it's male or female, whether blood or some other um, bodily fluid, uh, that would render the person unclean. Or thirdly, somebody that has had contact with a dead body. Now, I, I don't know what you thought when you were reading this, but it does sound incredibly unfair, doesn't it? Uh, you think of somebody suffering from a medical condition, like skin cancer, or a, a married couple for whom a bodily discharge is actually a normal part of their relationship, or a woman with her regular monthly cycle, or, or maybe somebody maybe that somebody has had a death in the family, and uh, maybe a parent has been holding a, a child in their arms that has died, a mother with her baby who has died. Um, to then say that that person is unclean and has to be out, put outside the camp sounds unfair and incredibly brutal and unloving, doesn't it? I think the point is, is that each of these conditions are contrary to life, so that in some way each of them represents or speaks of death in some way. God is the living God. He's the giver of life. And everything that is contrary to life is to be out, put outside of God's presence. So skin diseases, whether it's leprosy as we understand it, or whether it's um, some kind of skin disease, 
some other kind of skin disease, then in a way it represents a kind of living death. Bodily fluids themselves are invariably, the kinds of things we're thinking of, are, are bodily fluids that represent life, the giving of life. For example, in a marriage relationship, or those who touch a dead body are in contact directly with death itself. So the point is that death came in as the wages of sin, and therefore everything that is associated with death is unclean and must be put outside of God's presence. That's what verse three says. Verse three, you shall put out both, you shall, you shall put both male and female outside the camp, that they may not defile the camps in the midst of which I dwell. But you know, if we struggle with this, there's actually a much bigger issue that we have to face because our understanding of sin and of uncleanness runs much deeper, I trust, I hope that we know enough about the Bible to realize that our understanding of sin is, is much deeper than theirs was. Uh, we understand far more about the, the all per pervasiveness of sin, uh, what we call total depravity. You know, the Bible teaches that it's not that we're as bad as we could be in, in terms of uh, depth, but in terms of the width, every part of our being, every faculty is polluted and tainted by sin so that every thought we've ever had, every word we've ever spoken, every action we've ever performed, all of our motives, all of our desires, all everything in some way is touched by sin. Um, remember, Isaiah needed a life cold to touch his lips. As a preacher, he needed his lips to be touched. His greatest gift became his greatest problem. You would say the same about the apostle, about Peter. Peter thought he knew a thing or two about fishing. But in the boat with Jesus, he says, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. So our uncleanness is, is not restricted to a, a skin condition, to a bodily discharge or contact with a dead body. Our problem is that every single day, every part of our being is polluted by sin. You remember how the Apostle Paul um, graphically explains that. Remember in Romans chapter three, he, he describes so graphically uh, there is none righteous, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. They, with their tongues, they practice deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are all their ways. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Every part of our being is, is tainted, is tainted by sin. So, so we actually know far more then God's people in the wilderness knew about the how pervasive and how deep our sins run. But thankfully, we also know far more about how gracious God is. Tim Keller, you know, the American um, theologian and preacher, and, uh, he, he, said, uh, he said this, Tim Keller said, the gospel... The gospel, uh, the gospel is this, we are more sinful and flawed than we ever dared believe. And yet at the same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. I think Rick Otay said something similar, didn't he? You know that we are more wicked than we ever believed and yet we're more loved than we could ever dare think. See, God has provided a remedy for our uncleanness in sending his son Jesus into this world. It's interesting that all three of those specific uh, forms of uncleanness here in verses one to four, all of them are actually responded to by Jesus in Luke's gospel. Did you realize that? So remember how Jesus touched those who were suffering with leprosy. Luke chapter five verse 12, Luke 5, verse 12. The religious leaders thought it was, un, it was outrageous. It was unthinkable that a rabbi, you know, like Jesus, should actually touch unclean lepers, contrary to the, the ceremonial law of God. 
It was a bit like when Princess Diana, remember, famously went into a hospital and for the first time, and we saw on the television how she held the hands of men that were dying of AIDS. And it was shocking in the best possible way. Uh, and yet how infinitely more amazing that the Holy Son of God should reach out and touch those who are unclean with leprosy and make them clean. Or do you remember in Luke chapter 8, there was a woman who had had a, an issue uh, for 12 years, had been hemorrhaging, 12 years, had been bleeding. She had spent all of her money on, on doctors. On, she had tried to find help wherever she could. She was an outcast from society. She was regarded as ceremonially unclean. And then she literally touched Jesus. And instead of Jesus becoming unclean, the opposite happens. She becomes clean and she's made well because of Jesus. And then there's that third instance in Luke chapter 7, when a, a young a, a, a mother is, is at the head of a, a funeral procession coming through the gates of the city of Nain in Galilee. And it's like what happens when a when an unstoppable force moves an immovable object. You know, Jesus comes head to head with death, with a coffin. And it says in Luke 7 that Jesus touches the coffin and the young man comes to life. This woman's dead son comes to life again. So Jesus comes into the world to deal with our unclean souls. Jesus came into the world, Christ Jesus came into the world for sinners, um, to save sinners. And in order to make us clean, he himself becomes the unclean one. He was made sin for us so that he was put outside the camp. Did you notice those exact words in Numbers chapter 5 verse 3 are taken, picked up by the writer of, of Hebrews? We saw this not so long ago in Hebrews chapter 13. Remember in Hebrews 13 verse 12? Therefore Jesus also that he might sanctify, cleanse the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp. The exact words from Numbers chapter 5. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. So we're able to come boldly into God's holy presence because of our Savior, Jesus, because he took our sins upon himself. We've been made clean because he became unclean for us. So verses one to four, we see then how God deals with our sins against his holiness. But then secondly, in verses five to ten, Secondly, in verses 5 to 10, we see that there are sins not only against God's holiness, but there are sins against the righteousness of God. Verses 5 to 10. Now, all sin is sin, granted, but there are different types of sins. In the first section, verses 1 to 4, the sins are against the holiness of God that, that make men and women unclean in the presence of God. But you know, in a sense, it wasn't their fault, let's be honest. No, they couldn't. How can you blame someone for having leprosy or having a bodily discharge or or coming into contact, maybe in a moment of grief with a dead body? So maybe it, it, so it wasn't almost certainly wasn't their fault. But here in verses five to ten, it's different because these are now sins that God's people. Remember, this is within the camp of Israel. So these are the sins of God's people deliberately against others within the camp of Israel. So it includes, for example, stealing from somebody else. Or if somebody um, entrusts something to you, and then you tell them that you've lost it or that you haven't got it anymore. Let me give you an illustration, okay? Um, when I was in my early, when I was in my te early teens, when I was like tw kind of, well, 12, 13, 14, I used to go fishing with a friend of mine and his dad. 
So his dad would drive. We'd get up early. It was really exciting. We'd go up early in the morning and his dad would, and, and my friend would come and pick me up or I would, I would go to the house. And, and then we would set off and we'd go an hour, maybe an hour north. We'd drive up to somewhere, the River Ouse, maybe near Huntingdon, somewhere like that. And we would go uh, to fish on the River Ouse. And uh, on one occasion, I remember this is vividly sticks in my mind. We went on one occasion. And uh, we went to uh, the River Ouse, somewhere near St. Neots. And, uh, and, um, and my friend's dad, he picked his pitch where he was going to fish. And I went, I was fishing from the next pitch. And uh, when we got there, there was this really, really good quality land landing net. Now, that may not excite you too much. That may not mean too much to you, but it was a really good landing net, a good quality one. And so my friend's dad, he picked it up and he went and hid it in some long grass a, a little distance away. A bit later in the day, I thought it was a bit odd for him to do that. But a little bit later in the day, a chap came along and uh, this elderly man came up and he said, has anyone seen, by, have you had any chance seen a landing net? I left my landing net here. And my friend's dad looked at him. He said, no, he said, I haven't seen it at all. Carried on fishing. And then later, of course, at the end of the day, my friend's dad then picked up the fishing, it went and got the net and took it home. Now, um, that's pretty shocking, isn't it? Um, and, and I never forgot that, because even as an unconverted teenager, it struck me, what a, what a thing to do. I almost felt guilty by proxy. Um, but that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here in the camp of Israel amongst God's people. In fact, if you want to find out more details, you can look at the specifics in Leviticus chapter six. But the reason why it's so serious is because it's within the camp of Israel. These people are supposed to be like an army marching together to the promised land. They're going to come against powerful enemies. How can they expect victory over their enemies if they're not united? How can they expect to know God's blessing if they're fighting among themselves. So God provides a remedy, you notice. Verse seven, there must be confession. The person who has sinned must confess his sin to the person that he sinned against and to the Lord. So it means saying sorry, asking, acknowledging, acknowledging fault and asking for forgiveness. But as well as confession, then there is a second step and that is restitution so that he is to restore what is to be what has been taken he must pay back the person he's harmed injured uh, stolen from in some way in fact not only must he make restitution give back what he owes but in fact he is to in fact add one fifth to what he has taken you see verse seven verse seven then he shall confess the sin which he's committed and shall make restitution for his trespass in full, plus one fifth of it, and give it, give to the person he's wronged. You know, I couldn't help but think of Zacchaeus. Remember, if, if I've taken anything, then Lord, I pay it back plus a, a four times what I've, what I've taken. So, you know, this is really practical, actually, isn't it? Even in modern day terms, you think of our legal system. Um, he says, knowing absolutely nothing about our legal system, but. But, you know, if this was practiced, it would be quite revolutionary, wouldn't it? If we were to pay back the wrong that we've done, if we were to give back what we've taken, if we can do that and add one fifth on top of that. Now, three and a half thousand years ago, God gave his people a legal system, which in some ways actually is superior to our own. There has to be confession. There has to be restitution. And the other thing is that there must be atonement. There has to be death for the sin that is committed. Because it's a sin ultimately, not just a bit against another person, but it's against God, against you, you only have I sinned. You remember that uh, David prayed to the Lord, Psalm 51. So verse eight, we read, but if the man has no relative to whom restitution may be made for the wrong, uh, then the restitution uh, must be made to the priest. He must go to the, uh, the wrong must, be, must go to the Lord for the priest. 
in addition to the ram of atonement, which for which atonement is made. So there must be atonement, a ram, an animal must be sacrificed. There must be a blood sacrifice to make atonement for the sin that has been committed. Blood must be shed. A substitute must be offered for the guilty one. Well, what about us? What are we to do about our sins against the righteousness of God? Well, instead of a ram being offered for our sins, then for us, there is a substitute, a lamb, the lamb, the lamb of God, the Lord Jesus, who was holy, harmless, undefiled and separate from sinners. And the fact is, you see, that every one of us has done wrong. We do so every day. All our righteousnesses, if you were to heap them all up together, would be like filthy rags in the presence of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. What are we to do? Well, we're to confess our sins. We should seek to put matters right, making restitution where we can. But the one thing that we cannot do is we can't make atonement for our sins. You could spend, you and me, we could spend all day confessing our sins and seeking to make restitution. But none of that would deal with the guilt of our sin for which only the shedding of blood can deal. There must be, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So that whilst we don't have a, a ram, we do have a lamb. The lamb who 2,000 years ago, on a cross outside the walls of Jerusalem, was crucified. He shed his blood for the punishment of our sins. He laid down his life, bearing our sins in his body on the accursed tree. So that trusting in him, we can sing with Charles Wesley, his blood can make the foulest clean, his blood availed for me. And our sins, though they be as scarlet, shall be washed white as snow. And because he died, the righteous for the unrighteous, we can live forever, having been justified by faith, clothed with the righteousness of Christ. So Jesus is our atoning sacrifice, who died for our sins upon the cross. He made full restitution. Praise God, he made full restitution for our sins, having paid for them in full with his own blood, the precious blood of Jesus. And so Jesus, once again, is the remedy for our sins against not only the holiness of God, but against the, the righteousness of God. But that brings us to our third and final point, because Thirdly, in verses 11 to 31, the remainder of the chapter, the biggest portion of the chapter, we see that there are sins against the faithfulness and the love of God. Sins against the faithfulness of God. What is to be done about those? Now, <clears throat> what a strange passage, huh? Uh, verses 11 to 31, what did you make of this when we read this, when Alex read this portion? of uh, Numbers chapter 5, verse 11 to the end of the chapter. This sounds really strange, doesn't it? Um, here is a situation in which a husband has become absolutely convinced. He's, he's somehow convinced. He's so suspicious, he's convinced that his wife may have committed adultery. He may be right, he may be wrong. So he is to bring his wife to the priest, she is to publicly repeat the words of some terrifying curse that we read about. And then the priest is to take some dust from the floor of the tabernacle and he puts it into a cup of water, which actually is taken from the laver. Uh, he's to take some water from the laver. Nothing wrong with the water, um, but he's to put some dust from the floor of the tabernacle into it. And she's got to drink it, uh, having pronounced uh, uh, this curse. Uh, she's literally to drink her words, actually. Um, and and then everybody waits to see what's going to happen. You know, what, what is she going to be revealed to be guilty or innocent? Now, 
let's come on, let's be honest about this. You could be forgiven for thinking that this is some kind of hocus pocus. So sounds primitive, doesn't it? Can you imagine? Can you imagine what Richard Dawkins would do with this passage? Or a radical feminist would do with this portion of, of uh, from Numbers chapter five. Um, it sounds a bit like it sounds a bit like the kind of when I read this, I immediately thought about the way that they would have dealt with uh, uh, with with women who were accused of witchcraft, you know, in the kind of 1600s or, or in medieval times. Uh, when a woman was accused of witchcraft, you know, she would be brought out in public and put on a was it a dipping chair or something? Uh, she, she'd be tied or she would be bound hands and feet and she'd be thrown into the middle of a, of a river to see whether she would float or sink. Uh, if she sank, then wonderful, she's innocent, poor woman. And she goes, she dies, but she'll go to heaven. Uh, but if she floats to the surface, well, she's guilty, in which case she's burned to death. But here's the point. Although this passage sounds cruel, almost primitive, it, believe it or not, it was actually merciful in comparison to the practices of the time. You see, it, at the time, if a woman was accused, it was common practice, if a woman was accused of adultery, that she would have to put her hand in boiling oil. If her hand was unharmed, then she was, um, then, then she was, um, if her hand was unharmed, then she was pronounced to be, to be guilty. But if she took her hand out and it was badly burned as it would be, then she was innocent. So here in Numbers chapter five, God was giving them a way of dealing with suspected adultery that was actually more merciful than the, than the common practices of the time. Nothing's actually going to, by drinking water with words scraped into it and some dust off the floor of the tabernacle, is not actually going to harm her. And the point is, but the point is this, is that they're putting the whole thing into the hands of God. That's what they're doing. They're saying that we will entrust this to God to make his will known. Now, there is actually a bigger picture here. Because the, the message running through the Bible is that God, from beginning to end, that God is a husband to his people. Throughout the Old Testament, his people are his bride. And, and throughout the Old Testament, you know and I know that God's people were constantly going after other lovers, weren't they? All, all those lovers, is it Kylie Minogue saying? That's all I know. All, all, all those lovers. Israel was constantly prostituting themselves with other lovers. That was the message, remember, of Hosea. Hosea is to marry a woman that had been a prostitute. Uh, as a, as a, it, to show what God's love is like in, in bringing back again and again his adulterous people. Or read Ezekiel chapter 23, where in fact is, it's very, very relevant actually, Ezekiel 23, because God's people, his adulterous bride, are to drink the bitter cup and she is found to be guilty. And God says that he will divorce his people and send her away into exile. And that's, of course, is exactly what happens. They're taken away into exile into Assyria and into Babylon. But, you know, there's an even bigger story running through this. Uh, but there's a much clearer storyline running through this because we are the unfaithful bride. We have been guilty of adultery. We deserve to bear the curse of God and to be sent into eternal punishment. But God in his mercy has loved us with an everlasting love. God's love knows no bounds. We have prostituted ourselves with other lovers and been unfaithful to the Lord. But he will bring us back again and again. He will take us back. And he does so even though we've been so unfaithful and sinned against his faithfulness. Time and time again, God will bring us back 
because his own son will bear the curse instead of us. He will be sent away. He will cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that you and I can pray and cry, Abba, Father. Who is it that drinks the bitter cup? Isn't that the whole point of that lovely communion passage in Luke chapter 22? When Jesus picks up, takes the cup and he says, this is the new covenant in my blood. You see, wine was a symbol of joy. That's why Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. It was a symbol of joy. But Jesus says, this is the new covenant but not a cup of wine, but this is a cup in my blood. Not life and rejoicing, but death. And so for him, it is not a cup of communion with God, but it's the bitter cup being cast out of God's presence, outside the camp upon a cruel cross. And so Jesus must take the cup, the bitter cup, and he must drink it to its very dregs. And he, he prays, Father, if it is possible, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And so Jesus drinks the bitter cup, drinks the dregs instead of us. He is cast out so that we can sit at his table. Now, one of the blessings actually of lockdown has been some of the songs that we've sung, one or two new songs. And I, I love that sovereign grace hymn that we've learned during communion, during a lockdown, rather, during lockdown. I, I, it would be lovely to sing this at communion. The mystery of the cross, I cannot comprehend. The agonies of Calvary. You, the perfect, you, the perfect holy one crushed your son who drank the bitter cup reserved for me your blood has washed away my sin thank you jesus the father's wrath completely satisfied jesus thank you once your enemy now seated at your table jesus thank you do you know as I close, when I first approached this passage, I read Numbers chapter five and I thought, oh, do I really want to preach this passage? Maybe I'll just move on to a narrative that is much more interesting and so on. But, you know, as I studied the passage, you know, I thought to myself, what a blessing this is to our souls. Because what do we see here in Numbers chapter five in this, what at first sight seems to be such a bizarre passage we see grace, amazing grace, grace to cover all my sins. For we have sinned against the holiness of God, but Jesus has dealt with our impurity by being made sin for us. Our defilement has been fully cleansed by the blood of Jesus when he, the Holy One, became the unclean one for us. We have sinned against the righteousness of God, but Jesus has dealt with our sins by being made sin for us. We have sinned again and again against the faithfulness of God, but Jesus has dealt with our spiritual adultery by being made a curse for us. He drank the accursed bitter cup instead of us so that we can know his love, which knows no limit. Your blood has washed away my sin, Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied, Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, oh Jesus, thank you, thank you.